Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are around the world, and welcome to the Hedge on TV show. My name's Manuel, I'm your host, and I have the pleasure to have here on the line, remotely connected from the streaming studio, NPR competitor Christian Hauk. Hello, Christian, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. My pleasure, absolutely my pleasure. We've been discussing about doing this for a little while and now it's finally happening. I'm really, really glad. Oh yeah, like we talked about this for, I don't know how many weeks, right? And we <laughs> finally get it done. Yeah. So. Whatever, whatever, I don't know how many they are, but they were too many, right? Oh yeah. Okay, Christian, Mythic Championship 4, you placed 12. Congratulations, fantastic stuff. Oh, thanks so much. Like, <laughs> my second best but, uh, PT finish ever. So, yeah, 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 great, great, great stuff. But I believe you also have other things you are happy about, right? Because a lot of things happened over there, not just for you, but for the whole team, Phoenix New Dawn. Yeah, exactly. Actually, uh, Phoenix New Dawn was the best performing team on the Mythic Championship, which is absolutely insane. Like, we were the best team out of all. Um, so not only me finishing uh, on 12th place, um, TOEFL like, overshadowed all of us by winning the whole tournament, right? And, yeah, uh, yeah, Torav Severin, champion of Mythic Championship 4, absolutely. Yeah, so we had a, a huge showing at the, in Barcelona. Like, it was a huge success for, all, for our team in general. Like, amazing stuff. Yeah, pretty amazing. I was very happy actually, to watch coverage and also hear the news all around. And uh, congratulations not only to you, but then, but also to all the other members of Team Phoenix New Dawn. By the way, I'd like to talk a little bit about the team, Team Phoenix New Dawn. I mean, there is you, there is uh, Torad Severin, of course. There is Joshua Bausch, who is uh, like a regular presence here on Hedgehog TV. And then we have also Arne Uschenbett, Mario Seuser, and Jasper Grimmer. So it's exactly. like a team all made in Germany, right? Yes, it's all, uh, it's all made in Germany. All of us are made in Germany. So six Germans. Um, actually, in the beginning, it was kind of a free roll because, like, why not build a team together? Um, we had no expectations at all, but we were all friends. We were testing together. Um, and so we came up with this idea, why not uh, submit a team, right? A German team. And uh, yeah, it, it's Phoenix. Like there was Phoenix last season as well. And uh, this season it was Phoenix 404. And this uh, season we have uh, Phoenix New Dawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you had Phoenix 404 before and then you had yeah. Phoenix New Dawn now. I think Joshua actually mentioned it in one of the previous videos that we did together. There is like a little story behind this because the Phoenix is a reference from the, 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 the team from the 90s, right? With Kai Buden. Yeah, it's actually complicated. When I was interviewed <laughs> for my um, uh, PT Top 8 in Ixalan, uh, I got interviewed and they asked me about the team. And I didn't, at, th at that point, I didn't even know what the reasoning was behind the team name. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. But actually, it's uh, kind of funny. It's, uh, yeah, there was this German team, like the famous uh, German team before, the Phoenix team, Phoenix Foundation with Kai Budde, um, uh, Marco Blum and Dirk Barbarowski. And uh, we had the Phoenix team, but we didn't want that people think we are the new Phoenix from back in the days, right? Yeah, sure. So we call ourselves 404, right? Which uh, means probably not found. Right? Yeah, it is. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Reference. yeah. I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know this before. Like, the, <laughs> they, they told me <laughs> after my interview. So, yeah, it's kind of funny. But it's better than you know now, I mean, because you're part of the team. Yeah. Yeah, I should have <laughs> known before, actually, but yeah. Yeah. Better late than never, exactly. I would say. <laughs> Okay, a team made in Germany, but if I understand correctly, you don't all live in the same place. I mean, you are a little bit scattered all around the Germany. Yeah, we are basically all over the place. Like Arne Huschenbeth, Toro Severin, they're from Berlin. Jasper Grimm as well from Berlin. And uh, Marius, Joshua and myself, we are from the Frankfurt area. So, yeah, it's kind of like two two little groups put together. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, okay. we also played, uh, they played the team GPs together. 
and uh, we play Team Two Piece together. So yeah, it's basically two groups put together. So two groups that merged and became just one team. Exactly. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay, your testing methods. How how do you guys test since you are like not all in the same place? What's your testing method? Um, it depends which format we are playing. Uh, what we do today is basically we set up a Discord server for everyone who is in our team and we share our ideas there, like uh, ideas for constructed decks, ideas um, about limited. And uh, <clears throat> then a week before uh, the tournament, actually, we meet together in an apartment and uh, to basically uh, paper testing as well, talk in person to each other. but. The most work is done online, actually, um, uh, and we share our ideas through Discord. Um, then, obviously, which uh, format, like, Last Pity was Modern. So Modern, it's a little bit less work than Standard, because Modern is there for a long, long time. It's basically, I just call it a soft format for now. Um, sometimes there is new stuff happening, like the last time when Hogak actually was the new deck to bid. So we had to work actually on modern. Sometimes you don't have to work. You just pick one of the good decks in modern and you're probably good to go. But this time <laughs> we had a little bit of work to do. <clears throat> yeah. And for standard, obviously standard is changing weekly, uh, monthly. And uh, yeah, you have to do put more, more work into standard actually. And then uh, for the drafts, we draft online a lot and share our ideas. Um, when uh, War of the Sparks, actually, it was not Barcelona, the, the Mythic Championships before Barcelona. It was basically a pre-release draft at the Mythic Championships. So there were no options to draft before. So what we did, actually, we built a cube uh, out of cards. So we printed out all the cards because we knew all the cards from the spoiler, right? Okay, they, so physically printed. Yeah, they were, the cards were not available. Yeah. But we had the spoiler, so we printed out all the cards uh, in multiples, obviously more commons than uncommons and more uncommons than rares and so on. Yeah, yeah. And we built our own cube and uh, drafted with it. Like, uh, we met uh, a week before, as I said, and we drafted the whole week this new set with printed cards, with proxies, actually. Yeah, so this was kind of new, but it was necessary because we need to get our draft practice in somehow. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> it depends on the format, uh, but usually uh, we set up a Discord server and share our ideas there online. Yeah. So when you when when one of you guys is drafting, the other are like watching on screen what they do and the picks and stuff. For instance, for I think Chapter Two Four, the draft was Modern Horizons. So you were like doing this online, and uh, one player was drafting, and the other were like. Following oh, yeah. and discussing. Yeah, that, this is also what we are doing. Like, um, if one, like, for example, when I do do a draft and uh, some other members are online, they like to watch obviously my draft and discuss the picks and the plays. So I share my screen, I share my draft, and we're discussing each pick and each play in the rounds. So this is actually something um, I learned a lot by myself actually when I was starting doing this, not only by. Uh, sharing my own play with other people and discussing uh, the plays and the picks, but also by uh, watching them and uh, discussing stuff. Um, this is actually uh, a good advice uh, for other people, like if you want to get better at the game, um, share it with other people and uh, just hear what they have to say, right? Yeah. You will learn yeah, a lot yeah, yeah. out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the method and uh, it's working pretty well for, for you and for your teammates as well. So you can recommend it with no reserve, right? Definitely, yeah, definitely. Okay, okay. So let's talk about you and your performance right now and uh, the draft version of the tournament because Mythic Championship 4, um, in each day you had uh, three rounds of draft. So what I'd like to ask you is, which one of the two draft sessions was actually the most challenging? Which one was like the, the hardest for you to pull off? Yeah, easily the second draft, when uh, the feature draft actually. It was pot number one. 
Um, we're all sitting in eight and zero or seven and one. Uh, Torov, Severin, Toffel was also in the pot. This was definitely the more challenging draft. The first draft I did on uh, day one. Normally, when you're playing at the Mythic Championship and you see your pot, you're looking for other pro players. And uh, what normally happens, there are at least two to three pro players on your table. You've uh, seen somewhere before on stream. Uh, um, you know, you, you, you know these players. At my first table, I only knew... Uh, um, uh, I had one Japanese player, um, I think it was Yuki Ichikawa. Oh no, it was Desno from the MVL. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was the only pro I knew. So I was like, all right, this is, for a Mythic Championship, this is actually all right. Uh, it could be worse, let's say this way. And the draft actually went very smooth. I drafted the uh, Blue Black Ninjas. I had an in insane deck. Like it was, it had no rares, but all the best commons, a very good curve, a lot of removal spells, like, Basically everything you want out of a ninja deck, so I uh, played 3 and 0 easily. It was like exactly what I wanted. Okay, you were exactly where you wanted to be. Yes, yes. Mm, okay. But the second draft like was way more challenging because I started with black again um, to go for the best archetype in my opinion, which is ninjas. And uh, then the cards didn't flow. Like it wasn't open, it wasn't there. So I had to... A switch to something else in between the draft and uh, to the open archetype. I figured out what the open archetype was and I switched to it. It was a very good decision, but uh, it was way more challenging because, I don't know, like the pressure was higher and the draft was way more complicated overall. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, how did you actually understand that you had to switch to another archetype? Uh, what were the signals that gave you information about the open archetype that you went for in the end? Um, I mean, I started black, but I didn't saw any good black comments at all. I didn't saw any cards for ninjas after pick three. Um, uh, but other, like there are the, the snow cards, which is um, the Cankrixes and the Time Renders, basically all the snow payoff cards. Um, People don't like to pick them early because you have to commit yourself to the archetype to get a good deck, actually. And if you fail and the archetype isn't there, um, well, you end up with a mess, right? Your, your deck isn't <laughs> functioning really well. So people are a little bit scared of the deck, even though it's really good. But I saw like the payoff cards from the snow archetype still floating around while my ninja cards, they, were, they weren't just there. So I started hatching a little bit and picked them up and see where the draft is going. And uh, the snow cards kept flowing where like I didn't see any of the ninja cards. So it was actually a good transition. And uh, I actually hatched as far as pick three. Yeah, pick three, I already hatched a little bit to see what's coming. Um, and it paid off in the end. Like I got all the snow cards. Um, the deck in the end was, in my opinion, really good. Like, it was a really, really strong deck. I expected to go 2-1 with it, maybe 3-0 again. Um, didn't work out that well because uh, I played 1-2 and two with the deck, which I was very disappointed because mm -hmm. I think it was better than that. So, yeah. Okay, okay. So you think you went 1-2, but not because of the deck? Not, no, it was not because yeah, of the okay. deck. Was it because of you then? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. No, um, it was just not in the cards. Um, the games I lost, the first one was featured. It was really close. It was game three against Ellen Wu. And uh, I had kind of a mill snow deck, right? I My deck featured all snow cards. And I had four copies of the Cankrix, which uh, it mills two cards when I play a snow permanent. And uh, in game three, I had my opponent down to two cards in the library, and I had a snow permanent left to finish my opponent, basically mill him out. 
But he managed to uh, kill me the turn before I could do that in game three. Oh, that so it was, was very close. Then. It was really close, yes. It was okay. really close. Okay, and uh, okay. the second game I lost, like, uh, I just uh, lost to the Nuts, like, turn one uh, Changeling, the unblockable, and then turn two Ninja, the, the uncommon, the mythic uncommon Ninja in who draws cards for each Ninja dealing damage. So this is really uh, hard to beat, actually. So, yeah, it wasn't just... The deck was good, but... Yeah, it wasn't enough, sadly. Sometimes it's just not enough. Exactly, yeah. Sometimes you have to accept this. It happens in a long tournament. Sure, sure, absolutely. Let's talk about the constructed portion of the tournament. We're talking about modern and you guys, not the whole team uh, playing Tron, though, because I believe you were on Tron. Torah, of course, was on Tron. But the other guys of Team Phoenix New Dawn uh, chose different decks right in the end. Um, yes, yeah, so first of all, not all of Phoenix of Dawn were playing at the Mythic uh, Championship this time. I think uh, three of us did. And uh, two of us were on Tron. No, four. four of, let's, let's see. Who I think it's four time? because Arne Huschenbett was there and Marius Heuser as well. Exactly, Microsoft. so we were four yeah. this time. Yeah, yes, you so were four. four. Yeah. yeah. And uh, two of us played Tron. So actually... Um, uh, the three people, also David Brooker, he's not in the Team Phoenix New Dawn, but he's um, someone who tested with us. Um, he's also from Germany, and uh, he likes Tron a lot, as well as Thor of Severin does, and uh, myself as well. So we brought Tron even to modern Mythic Championships before, two times. So we are really Tron lovers, right? <laughs> we really okay, like it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but how did you identify that Tron was the right choice for Mythic Championship 4? Yeah, so, so as I said, we really loved the deck. But this time we felt like it's not going to do the job this time. It's not powerful enough. It has a bad Hogak matchup. So going into the tournament, the week before, we noticed Hogak is the new deck in Modern. And it's not only the new deck, it may be the best deck and the best choice for this tournament because it's so, so powerful. Like, um, people realized it only after uh, Piotr Klogowski, Kanister, played 12-0 um, on Magic Online with the deck. Like, swept through the tournament, even after Bridge was banned. So people were realizing this deck is so powerful, even without Bridge. Like, the ban didn't even... Maybe he made the deck better because now it's even more consistent, <laughs> which is yeah, crazy. Could be. Yeah. So we knew this is the real deal. So I played Hogak by myself and I was about to submit the deck because it's so strong. But, you know, there's a difference between uh, playing online and going into a high-level tournament like the Mythic Championships because people will know what's up. They will know this is the deck to beat and they will try to find things to hate the deck and uh, to beat the mirror match or to beat it in general. So I was kind of worried playing uh, the deck which has the target on its head, right? The Hogar yeah, deck. It's like everybody is looking at it. Exactly. So we tried to make um, other decks work to beat the deck, but it was really challenging. Like uh, the Tron deck had a lot, of, like we figured out what the meta game will look like actually in Barcelona. Um, the Tron deck had some decent matchups. The matchups against the top dogs, like it was pretty good. Like uh, blue white control was challenging for sure. And uh, the biggest problem though was the Hogak deck <laughs> because it was so fast. It kills you before you even get something going. So I was thinking about how we can fix that. And uh, the new versions of Tron, or basically the version of Tron everyone was playing at the time, was uh, with the new Karn. So it's a good tool. Like you have a, like, a lot of cards in the sideboard. You can grab a lot of artifacts. And uh, you can finish your opponent with a combo of getting a, a lettuce and play it so your opponent is locked out of the game. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Also, the Eldrazi Tron decks played for Khan, which I think is really good. The, I played a lot of Eldrazi Tron as well, and uh, the Khan really works there. But in the in the Green Tron list, I was never that excited by uh, the small Khan. Like, 
he was okay. He did some stuff, but it was never really the haymaker I uh, I I wanted. Actually, I wanted the the old haymakers, right? The room phone <laughs> engines uh, or the, the bigger engines, stuff. Or, yeah, yeah, the bigger stuff. So I was not that impressed by Karn, and also a problem with a new Karn is he takes a lot of uh, space from your sideboard because you have to play the switchboard in your sideboard. So you're losing a lot of uh, sideboard cards. So I asked my teammates, what they th who also like Torolf and David Brooker, who also were uh, still on the Tron side, like they didn't gave up the deck like the others did. They were still believing, right? So we can make this work somehow maybe. And I was asking them, what do you think about the new car? Were you impressed by it? And they were like, mm, it was okay, but not really. And I was like, yeah, that's the same I felt playing with the deck. So why not cut it? Like, get him out of here. Play some more beefy stuff. Like, add the main deck up. Play four Worm Calls. Worm Call was actually perfectly positioned against the decks. And uh, make room in the sideboard for more removals. Because uh, there were also like this new collector oof thing. The stony silence yeah, the on the stick, yeah. Yeah. which yeah, yeah. yeah, and if you don't have removal, like I face this card and uh, I don't have any removal left in my sideboard because of the card, you basically you can't do anything against it. It's really really hard to beat. So the why not cut the card completely out of the deck, make room in the sideboard for some removal spells, and of course for leyline of the void to fight Hogak, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The star of Mythic Championship 4 was Leyline of the Void in the end. Most played card. At, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the most played card in the tournament. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, it was. So the numbers, well, they were given on coverage back at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So we tested with these versions and we had game against Hogak. So all of a sudden, we had game against Hogak with four Wimpol engines and four Leyline in the sideboard, which felt amazing. So I was thinking to myself, well, I have this deck, which is pretty good positioned against uh, the big part of the meta game, and it even has game against the top deck, uh, the Hogak deck, which we didn't think it was possible, but with our new configuration, it actually was. And uh, yeah, we were all like pretty convinced about the new list, or the old list, let's say it this way. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody played the old list anymore, but we went back to it. Uh, all we did is played an old disc and uh, adding uh, ley lines in the sideboard, um, and it it worked. It worked. Yeah, I mean uh, that was it. I played seven o uh, oh no on the mythic champions. I played five and o against uh, Hogak. I played five times against Hogak. So fifty percent of our matches were against Hogak, and I won all of them. And okay. all of us were like the three guys who played Tron were all seven one on day one, which was amazing. And obviously, yeah, Toffel winning the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you got it right in the end. That's exactly, you You just went for the right choice. You had a perfect read of the meta game, and uh, it worked out in the end. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, really. It really was yeah. this way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, since we're talking about modern, um, let's talk about bannings, because we know that Wits of the Coast has already announced that the next uh, banned and restricted announcement is going to be released on Monday 26, and uh, Hogak is probably going to say goodbye. I would say most likely he's going to say goodbye. So what do you think about the modern metagame after Hogak? How do you think it's going to shift? Well, if they ban Hogak, right? We don't know if yet. Ban, let's, let's, let's assume that he gets banned. If he gets banned, and we don't have the Arisen Necropolis all around anymore, how do you think the meta will change? Yeah, I mean, there was a meta before Hogak, right? <laughs> before it yeah. like, even was there, there was a modern uh, meta. Sure. And uh, I think it will go back to there. Like, uh, there are a lot of good decks who will still be in modern. They won't get hated out, like Jund or Blue-White Control. Uh, I expect those to be the dominant decks first. And, uh, like, modern will always evolve around the meta game. You see decks falling out of favor, and coming back, depending on the hate people are playing, uh, you know, the old uh, um, affinity phenomenon. Like, affinity never won anything, then people didn't they cut all the hate against it, don't think it was deck anymore, and suddenly the deck wins something again. 
this is basically an example of modern because there are some decks which are pretty uh, consistent, as I said, like Jant or Blue White, but all the other proactive uh, strategies, they kind of like shine at the right moment, you know, when people are not prepared for it. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this will always be the case in modern. It doesn't, like if something is banned or not, like there, there are so many decks in modern and they will pop up eventually. And uh, it will change from month to month. Um, but the meta game itself, if Hogger really is gone, like Leyline of the White will not be in sideboards that much. It will put Dredge again on the, the radar of everyone. Like Dredge will be the new Hogger, in my uh, opinion. People didn't play Dredge that much because Hogak was just a better graveyard deck in general. And if you play Dredge, you have to face all the graveyard hate because everyone yeah. was prepared for, sure. for, for graveyard have, decks. Yeah, you need to have <clears throat> like four Nature's Claim in your sideboard, minimum. Exactly. <laughs> so I think Dredge will be one of the top decks again when, Trog, when Hogak is banned because uh, Hogak players will switch back to Dredge and... Uh, if people are cutting their graveyard hate or trimming ley lines again because Hogak is banned, well, Dredge will shine again. So I will. I expect a lot of Dredge, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, let's assume now another thing. I'm going really extreme. Let's assume that actually not only Hogak Reason Acropolis is banned, but also Faithless Looting goes away. That would be great. Like banning Hogak and Faceless Looting, but keeping Ancient Stirrings in the format, right? That sounds good to me. <laughs> so it would be like Tron reigning forever in Modern? What do you think? What do you think it would happen in that case? Oh, that's a good question, actually. I mean, Faceless Looting is a core part of a lot of decks. Like, uh, think about the Phoenix decks. <clears throat> you can't play Phoenix without Looting. Uh, Mono Red Phoenix, Blue Red Phoenix will disappear completely because... Yeah, they, they need the looting. They can't put Phoenix in the graveyard otherwise. I mean, they can immediately sure, thought sure. scour, but that's really not going to happen. Like, this is not good enough. Like, the deck will disappear. Yeah. <clears throat> then you have to think about, well, if these decks disappear, also Dredge. Like, faces, Dredge leads, uh, needs faces looting because, yeah, it's basically one of the key parts of the deck. Like, without faces looting, I don't think Dredge is good enough. So... Let's assume these are gone. Well, you can think about decks that are actually... Decks that are bad against these uh, strategies will rise up again, right? That's basically... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty natural. I see, I see your point. Yeah, I see your point. And, uh, but yeah, so... <clears throat> that's interesting. But the Ancient Steering stacks are still there. I like this idea, actually, because yeah. when you think about what I like to play, it was Hardened Scales and <laughs> Tron, which yeah, are both yeah. uh, based on Ancient Steerings, or not based around it, but it was an important card in both decks. So these were my two favorite decks to play in Modern. So I like this idea, actually. But, um, yeah, like, the metagame will change, definitely, because a lot of decks are not playable anymore. But... I don't think it will be bad for modern because maybe not that proactive anymore. Games will go longer for sure because all the decks uh, using faithless looting there are just like super proactive, super uh, boom boom. Find my uh, not start and beat you with it. Yeah, just so go and explosive, right? Maybe games will go a little bit longer and there will be more more interaction overall in the format. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it could could be a drastic change, but not necessarily a bad thing in the end. Uh, yeah, exactly. It will mm -hmm, be drastic change, mm -hmm. but not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe there will be some uh, strategies, some decks being too dominant because they don't. There's no something. There's no other good deck to fight it to keep it in check. But we have to see. We don't know beforehand. Like you never know. Sure. 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 Um, it was just it was just a curiosity, you know. Just came, the question came up, just because I wanted to know your opinion on that. But of course, it's very hard actually to make an accurate prediction based on this kind of assumption because this is a big change. Fatally looting being gone, it's something big. I mean, I like this change, and I would 
love to see faceless looting ban as well because when you look at modern in the last year like modern was dominated by faceless looting decks i mean that's just how it goes i mean we had a strong performance with tron but tron wasn't the best performing deck at the pt like it was actually performing pretty bad i mean we had a different list to be fair uh which was the key part like the key part of our success but Faceless looting decks are dominating modern for a long, long time, and I would love to see something new in modern again, like uh, new strategies. But you know, if you try to to brew something up or uh, play something you like, which is not tier one, but maybe it's good enough for modern, you're not sure. Like you will get just crushed by the faceless looting decks because they are so strong and consistent. So I would love to see a faceless looting ban actually to yeah shape up the format. Okay, so you actually think the faithless looting is somehow stopping new strategies to pop up? Yeah, kind of. Preventing them. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Okay. okay. It's uh, the same with the Splinter. You remember the Splinter Twin um, Exarch? Yeah, combo? yeah, the combo, yeah. yeah the deck yeah, was yeah. kind of fair. It did, obviously, it was unfair because it had the combo win, but people were, love, were in love with the deck because it was kind of fair and the matches were pretty interesting. But yeah. This deck actually prevented a lot of decks uh, being played in modern because they didn't stand a chance about this raw power of the deck. And uh, yeah, the faces looting decks are also very, very powerful, uh, maybe too powerful. And uh, yeah, they will keep dominating modern, in my opinion, if uh, it will be part of the format for the faces looting. So I would love to see a ban. Okay, okay. Um... Since we're talking about bandings and stuff, um, I read an article written by Emmanuel Gesselson for Hariruia, and he says that keeping on banning cards is not really the solution, and it's time to make some experiments and go for a restricted list for modern. Like, instead of having four copies of a card, having just two copies of a card, so that you still can have this sometimes very spectacular stuff going on, but it doesn't happen with that crazy consistency that makes decks really, let's say, oppressive. What do you think about that? Well, that's an interesting take. Uh, I never heard it before, actually, but it's an interesting take. You should read the article because I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's, it's like the idea is pretty interesting, but in general, I don't like adding a restricted list to modern. I think restricted in general is not a good thing to balance stuff out because you're still allowed to play with the cards. Uh, you're right, it's not that consistent anymore, but people will have these nut draws even with one or two copies uh, in the deck, right? If they draw these cards, then it completely gets out of hand. So it's more of a gamble than uh, like choosing a good consistent deck. I don't like the idea of adding uh, a restricted list to modern, actually. Um, yeah, it's like too too random. Uh, like, you have played, vin maybe, you, you, yeah, you have played Vintage before, right? Yeah, but a long time ago, yeah. when Vintage was called Type oh, you, 1. <laughs> you even play old school, right? You play, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And there are also these powerful cards like Ancestral Recall, yeah. the, the, the Black Lotus, or Time Walk, and stuff like that. And if you draw these cards, I mean, you can only play one of them, but if you draw these cards, like, what you're doing is so much more powerful than if you don't draw these cards, right? Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, so it's kind of a, I don't know, kind of a gamble. And I don't like that uh, idea for a for format like a modern. Okay, I think we disagree a little bit on that. Because to me, this aspect of the game is actually something that I find appealing. Uh, it doesn't happen that you go for the nut stuff all the time. But when it happens, it's really spectacular. And... Uh, now the magic actually is getting more spectacular than ever with all the coverage becoming, you know, better and better. I think viewers actually like to see these crazy things happening every now and then. It can't happen all the time. If you see Hogak played on turn two all the time, it, it's not really, you know, so nice to see because it becomes routine. But if every now and then something crazy happens, from, let's say, a spectator point of view, it's actually quite exciting, I have to say. 
And well, personally, I also like to play older formats, so I like to play these cards every now and then in old school, as you mentioned. But I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm a little bit torn into two, because I understand your point, but at the same time, I'd still like to play modern with the possibility of doing some crazy things every now and then. Yeah, I absolutely agree with your point. Um, like, from the point of view of, of uh, a viewer watching the games, like, it's a great thing, right? Not doing yeah, this every game, is. but sometimes they completely pop off. Like, it's uh, it's good for coverage and uh, it's a good viewing experience. But, like, you're asking me as a professional player and uh, if I just imagine sitting there playing a very important game, uh, a very high stakes game, and my opponent, like, just has this draw I can't beat because he drew this one card he's allowed to play. Um, it would be a miserable experience for, for, for myself. And this is why I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally understand the sense of uh, frustration. Yeah, absolutely. But you could get the nut draws yourself in another game, but you see you don't like That's that. That's true. Like, I would like that. I, I would love to get these nut draws, like, by myself, right? <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, it feels like kind of a gamble from a, a professional point of view, like if I'm playing by myself or playing uh, against other people in a high-stakes tournament. Um, this is what I don't like. But obviously for the viewers and uh, for coverage, I think it's a good thing. I agree completely with that. Okay, okay. I understand and respect your point of view. Totally, totally understandable. All right, it's time to wrap this episode up. Thank you very much, Christian, for joining me here. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was fun. My pleasure, absolutely. And a big thank you to all of you who've been watching this video. I hope, actually, we hope you enjoyed. Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And if you want to follow Christian on Twitch, where he streams regularly games of Magic on MTG Arena and MTGO, you find the link to his profile in the description of this video. All right, everybody, have a great time. Cast your favorite spells. And for now, it's goodbye.